Welcome everyone to our OpenSIM webinar. My name is Jennifer Hicks. I'm the OpenSIM R&D Manager and also the Associate Director of our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. I'll be serving as the moderator for the webinar today. I'm pleased to welcome today's presenters, Dennis Anderson and Alexander Bruno. Uh, they will be presenting Meet Me in the Middle, a thoracolumbar spine and rib cage model in OpenSIM. Let me tell you a little bit more about our speakers. Dennis Anderson is an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center and Harvard Medical School. He leads efforts to quantify thoracolumbar vertebral loading via musculoskeletal modeling as part of broader studies of the biomechanics of vertebral fractures in older adults. In addition to musculoskeletal modeling, Dennis is working to advance understanding of thoracolumbar biomechanics in several complementary areas including how in vivo measurements of trunk musculature from CT scans are associated with aging and physical function, and studying how thoracic kinematics are affected by aging, vertebral fractures, and hyperkyphosis. We're also joined by Alex Bruno. He's currently a biomechanics consultant at Exponent, an engineering and scientific consulting firm. At Exponent, he addresses issues involving the biomechanics of injuries and has expertise in the areas of human injury tolerance, injury mechanics, and multibody dynamics. Prior to joining Exponent, Alex received his PhD from the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology, where he worked with Drs. Mary Bookstein and Dennis Anderson on the development of the OpenSIM thoracolumbar lumbar spine and rib cage model that you'll hear about today. Uh, so with that, I will let Dennis and Alex take it away. Thank you, Jen, and welcome, everyone. I'm Dennis Anderson, and on behalf of Alex and myself, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present this webinar about our thoracolumbar musculoskeletal model. And I'd like to start with some thoughts on the underlying motivation for studying thoracolumbar biomechanics, which includes the need for a model like this. Our original motivation arose from trying to understand a specific clinical problem, which was vertebral fractures. Vertebral fractures are the most common type of fracture in older adults, but they are underdiagnosed clinically, and nearly half of them occur in unclear circumstances, making them difficult to study and prevent. Besides vertebral fractures, though, there are plenty of other reasons uh, why we might want to study thoracolumbar biomechanics. So a few, a few of these are hyperkyphosis, which is excessive forward curvature of the thoracic spine. And this is present in about 20 to 40 percent of older adults, but its causes are not well understood and there's no standard of care clinically. Another spinal deformity is scoliosis, which is prevalent in about 3 to 8 percent of the population. And similar to hyperkyphosis, the causes are not well understood and uh, management is primarily in term, uh, viewed in terms of preventing further uh, deformity from developing. Now, a big one that's sort of very broad is back pain, and this is the most common musculoskeletal condition and the most common reason people seek medical care. But of course, it has many, many underlying causes. And finally, uh, it's not all about the spine. Uh, and there's one unique musculoskeletal function of the thoracolumbar trunk, which is respiration. And there are multiple ways that the physical ability to inflate and deflate the lungs could be compromised. And so this provides another motivation to study the biomechanics of the thoracolumbar trunk. So while these clinical concerns provide sufficient motivation for the study of the thoracolumbar biomechanics, um, we would also note that the thoracolumbar trunk is basically the middle of the body. The overall center of mass lies in this region, and it also serves as the connection between the neck, the upper extremities, and the pelvis. And I'm just going to go through a quick reminder of thoracolumbar anatomy. The upper part of the thoracolumbar trunk is the thorax, and it consists of uh, skeletally 12 vertebrae numbered from top to bottom as T1 to T12. And it also has 
the rib cage, which includes 24 ribs, 12 on each side, which are attached to the vertebrae, and then the sternum anteriorly, which is connected to the bony ribs through the costal cartilage. Within the thoracic cavity, we have the heart and the lungs, and the rib cage moves to pr produce respiration. The lower part of thor the thoracolumbar trunk is the abdomen, which includes skeletally the five lumbar vertebrae, numbered L1 to L5. And within the muscular abdominal wall that surrounds the abdominal cavity, we have a, quite a large number of organs, including much of the gastrointestinal system. Now, in the spine, the connections between vertebral bodies, or vertebrae, I should say, are the intervertebral joints, um, which include both intervertebral discs, which lie between the vertebral bodies, and articulations between the posterior elements of the vertebrae. The ribs connect to the thoracic vertebrae at costovertebral joints, and then become the bony ribs become the cartilage at the costochondral joints. The point where the cartilage connects with sternum is the sternocostal joints, and only the first seven uh, ribs have the cartilage directly connecting to the sternum. The eighth through tenth ribs have cartilage which connects to the superior levels of cartilage, and ribs 11 and 12 do not connect to the superior ribs, and that's why they're called floating ribs. We should also note that skeletally the clavicle connects to the sternum here, and this is the only bony connection of the upper extremity to the thorax. Now, one of the great things about OpenSim is the active user community and the variety of models that this community has made available over the years. And I've listed here some of the most downloaded user contributed models, which have hundreds or even over a thousand unique downloads. And if you look at these models, all of them include the thoracolumbar trunk in some way, um, whether it's as the middle of the body in a full body model or as the base off of which the, the head and neck model is developed. However, a slightly closer look reveals a common assumption among these models, which is that the thorax is a single rigid body. Um, even in the lumbar spine model where the lumbar vertebrae are introduced as separate bodies, the, the entire thorax is considered as a single rigid body. And this rigid thorax assumption isn't limited to just the open sim modeling community, but it's a very common assumption in musculoskeletal modeling in general. So one question this obviously brings up is, is the thorax actually rigid, or is this a reasonable assumption? So to address this, let's just look at some very basic information on the ranges of motion in different parts of the spine. So here we have the cervical spine highlighted in blue, the thoracic spine in red, and the lumbar spine in green. And if we look at the total range of motion of these parts of the spine, we'll see that in flexion extension, about 30% of the overall motion is occurring or occurs within the thoracic spine. And this is pretty similar to uh, the amount of flexion extension that occurs in the lumbar spine. If we look at other types of motion, such as lateral bending, um, the thoracic spine actually has the largest range of motion um, compared to the cervical or lumbar spines. And if we look at axial rotation, um, again, the thoracic spine has a relatively large amount of the axial rotation of the overall spine, whereas in axial rotation, the lumbar spine is actually quite rigid. So based on this, it seems that the, uh, the validity of a rigid thorax assumption is not very good. So I think all of these uh, support the need for a fully developed thoracolumbar musculoskeletal model. Not only is the thorax not rigid, but the ability to estimate joint and muscle loading in the thorax will depend on modeling the joints and muscles in the thorax. Furthermore, because there are multiple conditions, such as vertebral fractures, 
where outcomes such as joint and muscle loading may be of interest, um, we've decided and worked over the last several years on in developing and validating a new musculoskeletal model. And we have now uh, published this model and posted it online for the OpenSTEM community to use. So the purpose of our webinar today is to introduce this model to the community. And we'll first go through an overview of the model um, and give some details about its development and validation. And then we'll give a few examples about how we've actually used the model so far, as well as some uh, discussion of the limitations of the current model and things we're working on um, that we hope to release in future versions of the model. Um, at the end, we'll have time for some questions. And as Jen mentioned, you may submit questions by text and any time during our presentation, and we'll have some time to answer questions at the end. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Alex Bruno, who will begin discussing the development of the model. Thanks, Dennis. So the first major step in the development of our model was defining the skeletal anatomy. And to do this, we used data from the literature to define the geometry of both the spine and rib cage. The figure on the left shows an average spinal curvature derived from the literature, and this is the spine shape we used in the model. For the rib cage, there was actually a great study by Gazek and colleagues in 2008 that measured rib cage geometry in CT scans by placing markers on major rib landmarks. So we have that data plotted out in the middle of the slide. And we fit cubic interpolating splines through the rib landmarks in order to model the smooth shape of the individual ribs. And the figure on the right shows what this looks like when we put it all together and open them. Now, to make this model more realistic and increase its potential usability, we really needed to add arms and a head and neck. And as Dennis already mentioned, the great thing about OpenSim is that there are several other freely available models out there, and we were able to incorporate both the Vasavada neck model and also the holes bar upper extremity model into our model to create a full upper body model, which you can see here. And this is something that we can now use to realistically simulate activities of daily living, for instance, to investigate spine and thoracic loading, which we're going to talk about a little later. Now, speaking of activities, the next major step in the model development process was defining the model joint anatomy. The intervertebral joints, which connect adjacent vertebral bodies, were all modeled as ball joints um, to allow for the flexion, the realistic flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation movements of the spine, um, and some examples of which are shown to the right. Now, the ribcage also has the ability to move in vivo, for instance, during ventilation, and this is facilitated by the costovertebral joints, which connect the individual ribs to the thoracic vertebral bodies. And we modeled these joints as pin joints, and the red arrow on the slide shows where we put the joint axis of rotation. And this was based on prior cadaver tests, measuring the stiffness and kinematics of the costovertebral joints. And when you model the joints in this way, you actually get the characteristic pump handle and bucket handle motions of the rib cage that occur during ventilation, which you can see in the video to the right. The next thing we incorporated into the model was the costal cartilage. The costal cartilage connects the tips of the ribs to the sternum, forming a sternocostal connection or joint, if you will. Now, we couldn't simply add joints between the ribs and the sternum to model this connection because OpenSim does not allow closed loops of bodies and joints in the model tree structure. Therefore, we use something called point-to-point -point actuators, which we've depicted in yellow on the right, to connect the ribs to the sternum and allow for low transmission through the thorax. And we essentially wanted these actuators to provide a reaction force between the ribs and the sternum, and therefore we set the optimal force of the actuators very high so that they would be favored by the optimization routine that OpenSim uses to compute muscle and actuator loads. The last major component that we needed to add to the model was the muscles, which are what actuate movement and give us the ability to simulate real activities. Now, OpenSim uses a hill-type model to represent individual muscle fascicles, 
and our model has 564 feeds, which is a lot, but it allows us to accurately model the complex anatomy of the trunk in detail. A diagram of a hill-type model is shown below, as well as a representation of its force output, which includes both active and passive components. And for these muscle models, the main input parameters you have to set are muscle tenation angle, optimal fiber length, tendon slack length, and maximum isometric force. Um, and maximum muscle isometric force is proportional to muscle area. We relied on prior literature studies to set or estimate these various parameters, and we also relied on prior literature studies um, as well as anatomical descriptions to define the three-dimensional paths and attachment points of the muscles in the model. So now I'm going to give you a quick overview of the muscle groups that we did include in the model. Firstly, we again leveraged the currently available OpenSim models. Uh, for instance, the major lumbar spine and abdominal muscles, as well as the latissimus dorsi, uh, were adapted from the lumbar spine model that was developed by Christophe and colleagues. In that model, the thorax was a single rigid body, so we had to adapt the muscles from that model to insert onto our detailed model of the thorax, which again includes individual thoracic vertebral bodies and ribs. And we did the same thing by adapting the neck muscles from the Vazavada neck model, and the shoulder muscles from the holes bar upper extremity model, again by adapting the fascicles to our articulated thoracic skeletal anatomy. And there were several other muscle groups that we needed to add as well that were not included in other OpenSim models. And this included the external and inter internal intercostal muscles, which are the main muscles involved in ventilation, as well as the serratus anterior and also the transversus abdominis muscles. Lastly, we added the trapezius muscle group and also the thoracic multifidus, which is the muscle that connects very close or adjacent vertebral bodies to each other. So those are all the major muscle groups that we have in the model. Um, but now we have this question of whether the muscles in the model are actually representative of a real live human being. And I'm going to pass it back to Dennis right now so that he can discuss that question in a little more depth. Thanks, Alex. So it's, it's common for these types of models, a lot of the muscle anatomy, such as where the fascicles are attaching, was ultimately drawn from cadaver dissection studies. And so often these will come from different small numbers of cadavers looking at very different groups um, and different studies for different muscle groups, for example. Um, and of course, then there's the question of whether the measurements that were taken in cadavers might be different than muscle looks in a living person. So we wanted to examine whether the muscle sizes and positions um, in the model were realistic relative to in vivo, in vivo measurements of trunk muscles. So to do this, we utilized CT scans drawn from a community-based cohort, the Framingham Heart Study, which is a large study of the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. And the Framingham Study collected CT scans of the thorax and abdomen to examine factors such as coronary and aortic calcification. However, we were able to use these CT scans to evaluate the size and position of trunk muscles. And so this figure shows an example of how we made these types of measurements. So here we have the um, transverse plane of uh, uh, lumbar spine at the L3 level, and we have outlined the, the rectus abdominis muscle in red. And once we have outlined this muscle, we can calculate the cross-sectional area in the plane, as well as, as the position of the muscle centroid relative to the vertebral body. And so these are the moment arm X and Y that we have marked here. And so we did this in a uh, sample of 100 people, uh, 51 men, 49 women, across a range of ages. And we looked at all the available muscle groups um, at each vertebral level from T6 to L5. And so this actually adds up to more than 12,000 muscles that we had to trace for this. 
And so we might have blown through a couple of research assistance risks, but we did power through and measure all of these muscles. And so this gives us a really good data set to compare, um, compare to for the actual measurements of trunk muscles in vivo. And before I go ahead, I want to just point out that because our model that we were developing um, and that we're presenting today is a male model, um, the data that I'm showing for the rest of this is based on just the 51 men in this group. So the next step is um, that we needed a way to compare the muscle measurements um, that we took to the muscles in the model. And so I like to think of this as taking a CT scan of the model. In this example, we have um, a cross-sectional scan, um, and here we have the trapezius outlined. And on the left here, we have a slice through the model, and we have highlighted the trapezius fascicles. And so we can look at that level in the model and say, which fascicles of this muscle group pass through here, how big are they, and where do they fall relative to the vertebral body. And so for this group of four fascicles in this case, we can calculate the cross-sectional area in the plane, adjusting for the angle of the fascicle path and any pination angle. And we can also calculate um, where the overall centroid of these fascicles is relative to the center of the vertebrae. So now we have a way to um, get equivalent measurements from the model that we can, can compare with the measurements in the CT scans. So with these equivalent measurements, we can see how well the model matches in vivo uh, muscles. And we can do this across the whole length of the spine that we have measured the muscle in. And so you can see here how well the model matches um, for example, for the erector spinae mu uh, muscle. And you can see that it follows a very similar pattern, but in this case, the, the size of the muscle, the cross-sectional area was um, quite a lot smaller than what we were actually measuring in vivo. And so then we were able to take the next step and actually adjust the muscle um, in the model so that it better matched the measured muscle and fell within two standard deviations. Um, but it wasn't always that the muscle was too small. Um, below, on the lower part here, we have the trapezius, which was originally bigger than we actually were measuring in vivo. And so with uh, an adjustment, we were able to bring that in line as well. And we did this for most of the muscle groups um, in the model. And in addition to cross-sectional area, we were also able to look at the muscle position based on the moment arm measurements that we took. And here I've plotted out the moment arm in anterior posterior direction and medial, medial lateral direction for the erector spinae. And you can see that actually in both cases, the original position of the muscle was sort of too close to the center of the spine, especially in the thorax. And so um, once we had done the adjustments, um, and basically moved the muscles out. The muscles matched the, the positioning of the muscles in vivo much better. So now that we have a model and we're um, fairly confident that our uh, muscle anatomy is pretty representative of an in vivo muscle anatomy, our next question is whether outcomes predicted by the model are accurate. And so Alex will now go through how we address this question. Thanks, Dennis. Uh, so like you said, now that we have this anatomically realistic model, uh, we really wanted to determine if it can make accurate predictions of spine loading. And to do this, we compared model predictions of vertebral compression loading and trunk muscle tension to previously reported in vivo measures of intradiscal pressure, uh, which is strongly cor correlated to vertebral compression loading. And also, to, um, we also compared the model to loading from telemetrized vertebral implants and trunk muscle myoelectric activity from EMG. And these in vivo measurements were recorded during a variety of different daily activities and body positions. And so we were able to simulate those activities or positions with our model 
and use OpenSim static optimization and joint reaction analyses to compute muscle forces and vertebral compressive loads from the model. And as I mentioned before, intradiscal pressure is highly correlated to vertebral loading. And this is literally the pressure inside the nucleus propulsus of the disc. And it's measured in vivo using pressure transducers that are mounted on the tip of a long needle that's inserted into the disc space. And intradiscal pressure has been measured in multiple locations of the spine. And you can see, on, you can see this on the right depicted by the red arrows. And it's also been measured during a variety of activities which we again can simulate with our model and compare the model predictions of loading to the measured loading. And here's what that actually looks like. So we found that model predicted intradiscal pressure was well correlated to measured intradiscal pressure in both the lumbar spine, which you can see on the left, and also the thoracic spine, which you can see on the right. And just to orient you to these graphs, the x-axis is measured disc pressure and the y-axis is disc pressure estimated from the model. And since our model outputs joint force in newtons and not a joint pressure, we had to estimate, estimate disc pressure from joint force using the cross-sectional area of the disc and a previously published correction factor. And each point on these plots represents a different activity, and there's a very good correlation between the model predictions and the measurements for a variety of activities. Um, and also the error bars in the plot on the right represent the range of thoracic pressures that were recorded in that study uh, since there were six subjects. Next, we compared model predictions of spine loading to in vivo loading that was recorded from telemetrized vertebral implants that had been implanted in two patients at the L1 vertebral level. And an example of one of those implants is shown here. And in this vertebral implant study, Rollman and colleagues normalized the loads that were recorded from the implants relative to standing loads. And so we did the same thing with our model for purposes of comparing. And the error bars represent the range of loads recorded in the two subjects. And you can see from this figure that the implant loads in red match the loads predicted from the model extremely well with the exception of the extension activity, which you can see here circled in red. But the fact that the model predicted loads were higher during extension actually makes sense when you consider that the implant has these posterior stabilizing rods and screws that will act to create an additional load path during extended postures and therefore reduce the load carried by the vertebral body. Since the model does not account for this hardware, that's why the model predicted load is higher. Lastly, we compared model predicted erector spinae muscle tension, which is the y-axis of these graphs, to muscle myoelectric activity that was measured from EMG, which is the x-axis of these graphs. And again, each point on the graphs represents a different activity, and you can see that model predictions are well correlated to the measurements in different regions of the spine. Uh, specifically, we looked at L3, L1 through L5, and also T4. So in addition to these in vivo comparisons, we also performed parametric sensitivity studies to evaluate the sensitivity, sensitivity of our spine loading predictions to certain input parameters and modeling choices. And the details of these studies are included in the manuscript that accompanies the model. Um, but I did want to point out that we varied things like maximum muscle stress, the physiologic cross-sectional area of the intercostal muscle groups, and the location of intervertebral joints. And for this, the main comparison was looking at how our simplifying assumption of locating the intervertebral joint at the geometric center of the discs affected spine loading compared to positioning it slightly posterior of that location as described in Percy et al. And finally, we also varied the costal cartilage optimal force which, as I explained earlier, affects the degree to which load can be transferred from the ribs to the sternum. And in general, we found that varying these parameters had relatively small effects on vertebral loading. And this is all quantified in the manuscript if you'd like more details. 
So now that we've done all this model validation work, we get to ask ourselves the question of whether our model is good enough to start using. And there's actually a very nice paper by Jennifer Hicks and Scott Dill that outlines best practices for validation of musculoskeletal models. And after reading through that paper, we found that our model validation process did in fact follow several of their recommendations. And these included comparing muscle paths and kinematics to imaging data, um, looking at joint reaction forces and making sure they're within two standard deviations of experimental joint forces, um, looking at muscle activity and EMG curves to see if they're qualitatively similar, and also evaluating the sensitivity of our model results to um, certain key model parameters and other modeling choices. So to summarize where we're at, we now have a 50th percentile male model that is freely available on the SimTK website, and we've included a link for that where you can download it as well as the manuscript that goes with it. And currently the model um, consists of a pelvis, 17 vertebra, 24 ribs, a sternum, a lumped head and neck, and also the upper extremities, and it has 564 individual hill-type muscle fascicles and approximately 150 coordinates um, or degrees of freedom. And we've performed significant validation on the model, which includes comparing the model results to in vivo um, joint loading and muscle activation, comparing the muscle anatomy in the model to in vivo muscle measurements, and also performing um, the various parametric sensitivity analyses that we had mentioned. So now that we have this model, and you can actually download it from the OpenSim website and start using it and playing with it, Dennis is going to show you some examples of different model applications. Thanks, Alex. So OpenSim, um, as many of you know, has different uh, tools to perform different types of analyses. And we haven't used all of these tools as, as of now with this model, um, but we have used inverse dynamics, static optimization, and joint reaction analysis tools. And so we'll go through some examples using the latter two, um, which is also what we use primarily in our validation efforts. So here are just a couple of examples of estimating vertebral compressive loading for the entire thoracal lumbar spine with this model. And this is done with a static optimization analysis while setting the model in a static position. And then you cal can calculate intervertebral joint loading and estimate vertebral uh, compressive forces. And as you can see, vertebral loading increases uh, quite a lot as you go from the top of the spine to the bottom of the spine. Um, and in, in these examples, we have the model holding some weight in the outstretched hands. And you can see that there are differences in loading between an upright posture in a more forward flexed position. And while our validation work that Alex has presented utilized static positions, we can now also use static optimization to calculate vertebral loading during a motion activity. So here we're simulating bending down and picking up a box. And as you can see, we've, we're plotting out the vertebral compressive load at the T1, T7, and T12 levels of the spine. And you can see that as you bend and lift, the flexing forward increases the loading, and that the T12 level has significantly more loading than the T7 or the T1 level. And you can also see a large spike in compressive load as the box is lifted. And then we also demonstrate twisting to the side before dropping the box, just showing how our model is able to simulate not just sagittal plane, but also um, off sagittal plane activities. So here's another example of a simulation that we've run with the model. And in this case, we have the model reaching out and pushing forward with increasing force until this object moves. And in this case, the plot on the right is showing not compressive loading, but the anterior posterior shear load on each vertebral level. And what's interesting here is that the 
magnitude and the sign of these of the shear load is actually varying between the levels, and this is largely due to the um, to the curvature of the spine, as some levels have a different tilt relative to the gravity direction of gravity than other levels. So here's just one more example that we wanted to show you. And in this one, we wanted to see if the model can simulate the motion of a rib cage during breathing. And here we have the plotted on the on the right, we have the average activations of the internal and external intercostal muscles during the expansion and contraction of the rib cage. And so these muscles are believed to be the, some primary muscles in respiration. Um, so it's good to see that they're activating in this uh, simulation of moving the rib cage. But I should point out that this is just a simulation of moving the rib cage because it doesn't actually include the resistance that would be applied when the lungs were expanded and air went through the airways. So this isn't really a model of breathing yet, but we think that this model can provide a platform for people who are interested, for example, in the biomechanics of respiration to build upon. So as I had said, uh, we are continuing to work on additional areas of model development. And so before we finish up today, we wanted to take a few minutes and discuss some limitations of the model in its current form and areas that we are still working on developing. One of the biggest limitations that we have faced is the lack of uh, the limited amount of data on thoracolumbar motion in vivo. And this is particularly true for motion of the thoracic spine and ribcage. So because of this, it's sort of difficult to be sure that we're using realistic kinematics. And in the examples that I showed, um, what we've done is estimated the kinematics based on studies that have reported the relative motion of various parts of the spine. Um, however, it's not clear if this data um, is applicable to all situations, um, such as if somebody is lifting something, does their spine move in the same way as if they're not lifting something? Um, and we also don't really know much about how much this types of motions vary between different people or in cases where people might have a spinal pathology. So there's definitely a, a clear need for additional information on the kinematics of the thoracolumbar trunk. Another limitation in our current model is uh, the simplification that we made in modeling the intervertebral joint as a ball joint. And as I mentioned in describing the anatomy, the actual intervertebral joint includes both an intervertebral disc as well as two articulating facet joints. And so it's actually a relatively complex, complex joint. And in mechanical testing studies, uh, people have found that um, the intervertebral joint moves not just as a rotational joint, but as a translate, but moves in translation as well. So it really has six degrees of freedom of motion. Um, furthermore, the stiffness properties of the intervertebral joints are coupled. And what that means is uh, mathematically put out in this equation here, where the moments and forces applied to the to the joint can introduce motions not just in the same uh, direction that the moment or force is applied. So for example, applying a moment that caused forward flexion uh, would also introduce some forward translation as well. So in addition to that complexity, like many other joints, intervertebral joints have a nonlinearity in their stiffness, meaning the farther you bend them, the stiffer they get. So for all of these, all of these reasons, um, we need to consider um, incorporating more complex uh, ways of modeling these joints. And um, because of the nature of these joints and the large number of them in the spine, the kinematics of the individual intervertebral levels are probably somewhat dependent on the stiffness. And so we need to 
uh, we've actually played with uh, how to incorporate more complex uh, joints in the spine um, using the OpenSim lumbar spine model uh, developed by Christophe et al. And we have published that recently, and I won't go into much detail about it, but certainly if anyone's interested, um, here is the, the paper, and feel free to, to look at that. But I'll just uh, finish up with this by saying that there's definitely a need for better characterization of the intervertebral joints and their stiffness properties. So now just a few other odds and ends um, that we're thinking about and working on. Uh, first of all, the model that we've currently developed and posted is a male model, and we are working on a female version, which we hope to release relatively soon. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the data that we used for validation was specifically measured in male subjects, so it may or may not be as uh, well validated in a female version. Additionally, uh, the model does not include the pressures that can arise within the abdominal and thoracic cavities. And the forces due to these pressures may be an important uh, may be important for the loading and stability of the spine, and it would also be needed to develop a realistic model of re respiration. Uh, and another muscle, the diaphragm, which separates the thoracic and abdominal cavities, would also need to be incorporated for that. Finally, uh, we simplified the cost of cartilage to point-to-point -point actuators, which does not incorporate the bending properties of the cartilage or the sternocostal joints. And so these are all areas that we have thought about and we hope to continue uh, developing the model in these areas and continue releasing updates as we are able to uh, address these limitations. So in summary, the model we presented here today is a novel addition to the OpenSIM library which fills in the middle of the body and has undergone, undergone a significant amount of validation already. Um, we've shown that it works quite well in static optimization, although we have not attempted uh, more difficult types of analyses, such as for dynamics. Nonetheless, we believe that this model can be basis for future studies in a variety of clinical conditions in the OpenSIM uh, platform, as well as uh, supporting future advances in musculoskeletal modeling. So we would like to acknowledge our funding support um, from the NIH as well as our uh, contract support with the Framingham Heart Study. And we'd also like to acknowledge a, an NCSRR Outstanding Researcher Award, um, which allowed us to attend an open sim workshop uh, early on when we were starting to develop this project. And that was a very helpful experience. Uh, we'd like to thank our colleagues here at the Chaos Lab at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, including Mary Buckstein, Caitlin Burkhart, Jack Ming, Brett Allaire, and several others who have contributed to this work. We'd also like to thank some of our other collaborators in our studies of vertebral fracture, uh, particularly Doug Keel, Lisa Samuelson, and Tom Travison. And finally, we'd like to once again thank the OpenSIM team and the MCSRR for the opportunity to present this here. So at this time, I think we're ready to open up for questions, so I will ask Jen to take over and moderate that uh, Q&A session. Yeah, thank you, Dennis and Alex, for a great talk. Um, it's great that you're sharing the models that you're developing and also uh, focusing on validation. Those are, are two uh, really key points for, for pushing the whole field forward. Um, so if you have questions uh, for Dennis and Alex, you can go ahead and find the Q&A panel in your WebEx controls uh, and type in your question. Uh, make sure you select to ask all panelists so we can see your question. Um, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, uh, I'll go ahead and ask one. So you uh, brought up uh, a great point that the you know the quality of the simulations of the of the motion with your model will depend on the quality of the input uh, motion data 
and you mentioned that there's not, um, you know, not all the data available that you need. Um, so I guess what maybe this is something you're working on. So what would be, you know, the I what kind of data do you need? You know, maybe somebody in the audience already has it, or, or what kind of um, input data would would best help validate your model from a kinematic standpoint? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and I. I would say, first of all, yes, that is something we are working on um, to get um, some better data on the kinematics of the spine. And I think there, there's kind of several levels of data. Um, first of all, you know, the, the kinematics of the spine are, are hard to, to see from the outside because you have so many joints that are having relatively small motions. And there has been some work utilizing um, biplanar radiography or bi biplanar fluoroscopy to look at uh, motion in a lumbar spine, and we actually utilize some of that in uh, in our looking at six degree of freedom uh, lumbar joints in our the other paper I mentioned. Um, so that kind of data is, is definitely helpful, but it's not ever going to be like I don't think a standard for something that we get to collect in a lot of people. Um, so then the next question is how can we utilize something more like a standard motion analysis as a kinematic input for this type of model? And that's something that we're we're working on and hope to make some progress on uh, in the next few years. But certainly other people may, may have ways of doing that and they can now take the model and work on that problem as well. Okay, thanks Dennis. Now we have a question from Clement Favier. Uh, what would you expect of muscle forces and joint reaction forces estimated by the model if you were to include stiffness properties of the disc? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, what we find, and um, <laughs> seems like I'm plugging this other paper quite a bit already. Um, that's one of the things that we played played with in that lumbar spine model, where we were introducing stiffness into the, the intervertebral joint. And it does uh, it does have an effect. It tends to um, lower the muscle forces because the muscle doesn't have to balance as much moment because some of the intervertebral stiffness is, is taking that up. And that's uh, particularly true when you start to move into um, larger joint angles because obviously the, the stiffness um, produces more of a a reaction moment the farther you move the joint. So in general, I would say we, we would expect to see lower muscle forces, and in the, and because of that, then you would see some reductions in um, compressive loading, for example, as well. Okay, thanks. Um, so Clement has another question as well. Um, he's wondering if any muscle force length properties were used, or if inertial properties for the or initial parameters for the bodies were taken into account in your simulations. Uh, yeah, Alex, do you want to grab this one? Sure thing. Um, so the inertial parameters for the bodies um, have not yet been taking, taken into account. So the simulations you saw were quasi-static in nature, so it was a successive series of body positions, and in terms of the muscle question, the muscles do take into account force length relationships, and they all, they also have the force um, velocity relationships in there as well for when we eventually do do truly dynamic um, simulations of movement. Okay, thanks. So now a question from Hussein Mak. Tarzadeh, apologies if I mispronounced the last name there. Uh, could you please comment on scaling of the vertebra itself, uh, especially when adjusting muscle moment arms? Sure, I can I can take that one. Um, so for scaling the size of the skeletal anatomy in the model, we've been using the open sim scale tool where you can basically change the, the size of a body along the x, y, and z dimensions 
So for changing the size of the vertebral body, the bodies themselves, um, we're uni you know, uniform, we can uniformly increase or decrease the size of them um, in proportion to someone's height or body weight. Um, and then the muscle scaling is something that we can do separately after that um, scaling to someone's body stature. So, for instance, if we had subject-specific uh, muscle measurements in someone or we were trying to scale to an average of someone's muscle CT measurements, we could then move the muscle moment arms after that scaling to someone's stature. All right, thank, thanks for the answer to that question as well. Uh, now we have a question from John C. Uh, he says, thanks, uh, very nice model and good previous work. Um, his question is, can you easily alter the sagittal posture of the model to represent different patient presentations? For example, asymptomatic Rashuli types one to four for standing. Um, yeah, I would say we uh, definitely like sagittal plane curvature can be relatively easily uh, changed in this model. Um, it's just a matter of, so, so we did, as, as Alex showed in the development, we basically developed the model to have an average spine curvature in the sagittal plane, but um, it, that could be altered simply by changing the orientation of of the local coordinate frames at whichever level that you wanted to, to alter it. Um, now, the, there might be a question of whether that the muscle or something should also be adjusted, which we haven't really, uh, I, I guess I don't have a good answer if, if someone had a follow-up like that, but certainly just the, the skeletal um, curvature could be easily adjusted. All right, thanks. Um, so now a question from Xiao Hu. Uh, thanks for the presentation and really great work. Uh, I wonder what your plan is to incorporate the diaphragm into your current model. Okay. Um, so that, that is a good question. We, we have, uh, we have uh, done that in at least just uh, testing it out. Um, the diaphragm is, is sort of an interesting muscle because it all uh, it attaches around the outside of of the rib, the base of the rib cage primarily, um, but it come it all comes together in the center, um, to what's called the central tendon. And so, um, what we what we have played with doing is creating an, another body, which would be the central tendon body, and attaching fascicles to that. Um, but that's that's just what we've played with as we've um, thought about how we might do it in the future. Yeah, that's a, so having multiple actuators connect to a single tendon is challenging from a, a multi-body dynamics standpoint, so, so that complicates the model. Right, because it's, it's not, there's not like a joint that connects it to the, the rest of the, the skeleton, so, you know, we had a lot of discussion about how we would actually, like, within the the Model 3 where it should be, you know, sort of attached, um, mm -hmm. even though, you know, it's sort of just floating in the middle there. So I don't, I don't know that I have the, you know, the, the final answer on that yet, but um, it's certainly, I think it's an open question. Okay, so we have time for one more question. This is from Carrie O'Bannon. Uh, how useful is the model for studying lower back issues without the gluteals and other associated muscles? Um, Terry studies seated by a mechanic, so is, is wondering if the model would apply. Yeah, that's a good question, and um, I mean, I think the answer is it just depends on what your your research question is. Um, but certainly, there's nothing that would prevent someone from incorporating some existing models of lower limb or gluteal uh, or hip to to put that onto the, the pelvis in our model um, if that was something that would, you know, benefit their research question. Right. All right. Um, so uh, it's almost 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for all the great questions. Uh, thanks, Alex and Dennis, 
uh, again, for the great presentation and, and sharing the model. Um, so to wrap up, let's can you bring up the last couple slides for me? Uh, so we, we took care of questions. Uh, I definitely want to acknowledge funding sources for OpenSIM in the webinar series. We were supported by several grants from the NIH, including the NIH grant that funds our National Center for Simulation and Rehab Research. Um, we're also supported by the DARPA Warrior Web effort. Um, next slide. Uh, you can find information about the center, upcoming events, and other resources from the OpenSIM community at our website. Uh, you'll also get a follow-up email that has a link to uh, the SIMPTK project uh, and uh, any other relevant links if you want to uh, learn more about the model and try it out. Um, please complete the survey that will appear in a pop-up window at the conclusion of the webinar to help us improve our webinar series and choose upcoming topics. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone for participating, uh, and we hope you'll continue to stay involved with OpenSIM. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.